Okay, let's reconvene. Uh, I had an excellent question during the break, uh, which is, uh, I, I've made the point that you can make as much as you can, you can make as little as you want, what would be considered kind of normal or normative uh, for this. And um, the elements which I am principally covering today, I am covering because they're the kind of elements that essentially everyone would normally be using. If you looked at a description of a manuscript in an article or a catalog, you would normally see all of these elements, but with different emphasis. One might be really interested in binding information. One might be interested in where the decorations are. One might be interested in the marginalia. So we would normally see all of these items, but at different levels of emphasis based upon the project. And for a project like the Monasterium project, where there's 600,000 charters, we have all of these fields for every single charter. However, for huge numbers of them, most of these fields are empty because the catalog information was not interested in that particular field, but another catalog might have been interested in it. So in order to have a union of so many disparate libraries were and archives worth of material, we need to allow all of these fields in, even if we're not always using them. And with very few exceptions, like I said, MS identifier is required in MS Desk unless you turn it off. ID number is required within MS identifier. Most of these fields can be blank and in many cases will be blank. For all of these manuscripts that I'm presenting, for the most part, except for the ones from our colleagues at the Cooking Books uh, from the Middle Ages project, Korama, that uh, Sarah already talked about a little bit, the text field is text and text, because we don't have text. These are just catalog records in TEI. For other texts, uh, they have an MS identifier that says the shelf mark, and they have a text, and they have very little cataloging information because the person who contributed it was interested in the transcription. For other texts, there's huge amounts of specialized markup for semantic or other specialized projects. And part of why we're talking about MS description too is not to get into all the different possibilities. I wouldn't be able to tell you about any of this linguistic annotation anyways, because I'm not someone who works with that. I'm someone who works with uh, and uh, I was about to say hand shifted, uh, manuscripts and rare books. And so uh, the vast majority of my experience is working with these items. I also have some slides, which I will try to put the link up to, that provide some basics about how you might encode text, gaps, lacunae, whatnot, that were presented at a previous summer school. Uh, but that's not the purpose of what I am talking about today. That would just be as a reference. So uh, we would normally have, we would always have the MS identifier. We would normally have some kind of alternative identifiers because catalog records are always changing. Um, we would have physical description. We would have at least some mention of what the com uh, contents are, right? But, you know, there's one item in one of these collections, which is a silver knife, which is co-housed with a manuscript. It doesn't have a lot about its contents because it is a knife, but they decided because it is co-housed, in a manuscript, it needs to somehow be recognized in that because it's part of the shelf mark of that manuscript. So it is just there, but it doesn't have a lot of these pieces of material you'd expect. However, it does have things like object description where it says form, knife, uh, material, whatever the material is. I think it was silver, but it could have been some other thing. Um, here though, we have a paper codex. Right? And you could have a controlled vocabulary for specific types of paper. Um, and you could insert that at different levels. At this form, we would have codex and paper. If we knew things about the specific type of paper, 
I would probably put them lower in support. But having these specialized elements under here depends upon your expertise and your interest. You might just say parchment codex, done. That is the, you know, support description. There's material, there's parchment. You know, there's a form, it's codex. And you don't describe it much because we don't necessarily have a lot of comparable and useful information about historic parchments, except in the rare cases where they've been DNA typed. Um, but here he discusses the different types of paper in prose. And we have a locus group, which is a computer readable set of locations within the manuscript so that we could then link to them automatically that says, um, where are whatever is being discussed? And uh, I haven't gone through entirely in this manuscript, but every time he's written a page range, I've run a little script that basically turns it into a locus group so that he writes a page range, we get computer readable text out of it. But you can see that these locuses are a combination of from and to, that's the computer readable information, the information that I use presenting it in the HTML usually, and then a human readable part where if I'm just presenting this as a paragraph and formatting as text, we would actually only present the human readable part. So it depends what we're using for. Linking would generally use the computer readable part, um, whereas prose would often use the human readable part. Um, and so this may be complex or it may be simple in your particular usage. So uh, extent is something that is almost always mentioned in catalogs. It's something that I have specifically had problems with in these large combined catalogs that people use. Now the first part is generally pretty easy. It's got 205 folios. We need to make sure that we know when somebody's saying what they are, are they giving us an extent in folios or pages? We have a unit. The unit's telling us leaf. So the human readable part is telling us they're folios. So we know whether or not we're talking about pages or folios. We know in a computer readable way and a human readable way. Something that really surprised me when I started doing data cleaning on our big monasterium database with all the charters from all the libraries all across Europe is that all of these libraries have different practices for the dimensions of their charters. And a lot of charters are kind of square, so you can't tell obviously from looking at them what's the width and what's the height. And so when you just write something like you might see in a catalog <laughs> description in print that says 25 centimeters by 18 centimeters, we might assume it's taller, so that's the height, the second one's width. But we don't know if this was actually a wide book and you didn't know because there was no declaration of what the practice was, you would be reading the wrong information. And the computer would definitely not know what to do with it, which is why we always need to declare what the unit is, and what it's describing. So we here have height, the quantity is 25, 25 what? 25 centimeters, not inches, you know, uh, not yards, not meters, you know, completely unambiguous. Theoretically, you could do that level of detail for anything that you're marking up. This is one of the places where that level of detail always makes sense because this information is really ambiguous otherwise and can be very hard to clean in your data set if it's not provided. Uh, so here we see that we've got a separate dimension for the binding and the leaf. For this particular manuscript, they've been trimmed to the same size. It's not actually an issue. Many manuscripts, they are not. But here we see what this would look like in the print version that we are basing our notes off of. And here we see the corresponding issue, uh, uh, the TEI, and the fact that uh, we have increased the specificity when making it encoded. This also applies for things like languages. If you're contributing to a large database, please use the actual ISO codes for languages. Monasterium had the language German inputted in at least seven different language, seven different ways. 
in English, in German, in abbreviation, in different declensions of Czech. Um, and so if you searched for German in the database, you wouldn't know which search term to use and you wouldn't know, you wouldn't get all of them anyways until we did the data cleaning and we put them all in controlled ways that we can search with across the database. So these are things which are always best practices to put there. They're widely accepted standards across all kinds of encoding. And so I'd always encourage you to do them. But like I said, sometimes you just don't have the information and we're going to see that. Here we are talking about the collation. Eric, as you probably gathered from his presentation, is dealing with a lot of highly disturbed manuscripts that have been rebound, rebound out of order. It's very important for him to know the collation of those. Some other manuscripts, however, like the one we were just looking at, they're integral, they're regular all the way through. So when you get a visualization like this, can you tell the two places that there's a disturbed leaf from the visualization? I can't even fit the visualization on the slide at a readable thing. Um, so there are these visualization tools. This one's made with Visicodex. There's also Visicol, which is a related project, which came out with a new version recently. Um, so you might want to consider uh, we're only going to show choirs where they are disturbed in a visual way in order to not be misleading. Uh, we can present them as we have here in, we, the Korma people have put here in one of the Graz cookbooks in different formulas. And if we make these regular enough, we can translate them automatically into different formulas, into these um, versions of uh, visualizations. But we need to consider what we're doing for our manuscript and whether we're actually presenting useful information to our users. I did this for this particular manuscript and then I kind of tried to fit it in our web page. And I literally have no idea how to get this display in a way that seems useful to our users. Because it actually is like scrolling down at the size that is readable on a screen for like the equivalent of several feet. Um, and I don't know that that would necessarily be useful, but for something like that palimpsest, which is highly disturbed, which might have two different ways that it's associated, well, then we might have a lot of really interesting ways that we would want to visualize it. We'd want to move, you know, leaves from one to another. So consider when you're creating visualizations like this, when you're storing this information, what is actually useful to my users? what might actually be doing more harm than good in the presentation. And uh, in this particular manuscript, I think presenting the entire visualization, it's not terribly helpful, whereas telling there is one folio here, which is out of place, showing that choir might be interesting. But that is up to you what is interesting for your manuscripts and your project. I can't tell you. Here's an excellent collation uh, from the Koroma project that describes different collation aspects of their source, which you can see down there. And then we would go on to layout desk. I'm back to using the Syriac manuscript. This is a very simple layout desk. We have more layout information in here, but really the part that I would be interested in immediately, and which may be all that describes a lot of manuscripts is it's in one column throughout. We don't need to know Anything else at that point? Oh, except there are two columns. We have a locus. You can go look at that if you want to know why is it weird on that page. Immediately tells you the interesting part about the changes in the layout. A very complex manuscript like Manuscript 32, what we saw the Gratians to Cretan with the big uh, commentary around it with the huge amount of marginalia and the illumination and the hierarchy of illumination might have lots of changes in layout, complex descriptions, and you have to decide what is in your budget in terms of hours, in terms of your sanity, in order to describe this. 
And that is partly why most of these desk elements just allow you to just write a paragraph. Write what you would write. And if there is something that it can be usefully controlled for a linking purpose across projects, then start regularizing it. Hand description. Hand description is where we talk about the different paleographical aspects. There are three different hands in this manuscript. There is a major hand which wrote almost all of the manuscript. It is noted as scope major. And there is uh, a locus which is not on here, which says that this hand appears on every single text block page, right? There is a minor hand, which is in a different script, which appears only in marginal annotations on various pages, and we have noted which pages it appears on. These hands are described differently, and uh, we have linked them back to where they are. Now, we were discussing this, how would you say that poem one was written in hand A and poem seven, but these things, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can make a list of locuses. These pages, lines, whatever, were written by this hand in the hand description. You can use XML IDs. Remember, XML IDs always uniquely refer to the element that they describe. So if uh, different poems are switching back and forth between hands, then you can take a list of the XML IDs for each of these poems and you can put in the hand description which ones it associates with. You can make zones, which we'll show at a later time, on the manuscripts that actually like draw boxes on the facsimile version around the hands that you want to describe. So there are a variety of ways you can do this, and part of that is how you want to approach it. And sometimes this is very frustrating. There's no right way to do this. There's just several ways. Um, and sometimes that flexibility is frustrating. But sometimes that flexibility allows us to do what I think are kind of interesting things. So I mentioned before that if you have an ODD, the one document does it all format. It documents your project, but it allows you to also make project specific extensions. This is a project specific extension that I wrote because I read all these hand descriptions and they say there are these characteristics of the A or when we're talking about Latin, everyone knows, everyone likes to talk about the G specifically. Uh, well, depending on which script, A or G usually. Uh, and I'm kind of like, well, I know the general classification, but I'm always trusting someone at a huge remove to have correctly represented in text the features of this hand. I'm not sure I just always trust them or agree with them. I would like to see it. This is something that I wrote where we are marking up little triple IF regions to show one example of every character form for every manuscript hand in there. This is like those indexes of manuscript hands, like there is a big Syrian project on this, but they are doing it completely separate. They are going out there copying little sections and they're putting it in their database. I wanted to do this because we want to describe the hands. We wanted to show it on our page, but we also can then make this immediately exportable to projects like this. So every time you describe a hand, right, you can immediately export all this so that anyone else working in that same thing could add that to the list of what different hands look like, compare it, what are the actual characteristics across these letters, forms? Are we imagining that they look the same because we've been trained to look, think they look the same? Or do they actually look the same? Because none of us have looked at every manuscript. So kind of my current kick, personally, with my binding tool decoration project is at the end of the day, if I tell you it is an X-shaped tool with two lines and a dotted line down the center, and that that is a category of tools, I would like you to be able to click on a button and it will show every single tool impression that went into that decision. So you can decide, no, he's wrong. There's actually two separate tools here that are distinct in a way that they have been cut differently, that he has cataloged together, 
right? And now we can describe this as two separate tools with consistent characteristics instead of just assuming that I say these are all X-shaped tools and now we have a category called X-shaped tools. You see an X-shaped tool and you go, this is the X-shaped tool category. We are increasing the specificity, showing our work. That is my personal uh, thing right now for my work in. So we have implemented in the Syrian project. This is actually in a specific ODD that only includes this particular set of encoding. You can just copy it out, paste it into your project without changing any other details about your project, right? Uh, we also include it in the ODD for the project with all the other decisions we have made about our project. But this is a way that even before it gets to the technical council and becomes like official part of the TEI, you can change the encoding in a way that suits your project needs and uh, the like. So um, making our way the rest of the way uh, through MS description, we're in history. So history, you can see here, we have origin, you know, where and when is it from? Provenance, where has it been? And acquisition, which is about how did it come to where it is now, describing it in the characteristic of its current location, um, which often libraries are less than willing to share. Uh, so sometimes these are all just blank pieces of information. Sometimes we know nothing about the provenance, right? We have an acquisition note donated by X to the library in date, and that's all we know about it, you know? And then we have things like, we think that it is 12th century. How does the computer read that? We tell it the earliest date, the latest date, and we make that arrange so that when we organize our manuscripts chronologically, it can do that. I have not covered everything that is in manuscript description. There are these other common elements uh, that you would be interested in using in some projects, maybe not in others. Uh, are you really interested in describing the binding? We have binding description for that. Sometimes people just write, in Morocco leather, plain leather, wooden boards, right? Sometimes there are elaborate, you know, actual binding historians trying to do complex things. Deco desk, decorative and illustrative elements. Sometimes this is illustrated throughout. Sometimes it's a locus group. There are illustrations here. Sometimes there's a little decoration item describing every single image throughout a manuscript. Again, an art historian looking at the manuscript as art history is going to have very different priorities when using DecoDesk than probably a library that just is letting people know there are illuminations in this. Uh, it might be that there are large full page illuminations on these pages there are initials throughout, there are initials at every chapter. As precise as you want, using XML IDs, you can of course link it back to the, the exact items. Using locus groups, you can say the exact locuses. But this is one of those things where you're never going to have a project where you're gonna maximally encode deco desk and you're maximally going to encode binding desk and you're going to maximally encode stuff in text unless you're working with some vastly famous manuscript that everyone adores, because there's never that kind of budget, unless there's like one illustration in your manuscript and maximally encoding it is one entry. So um, this is one of those things where you have to decide and nobody else can what is possible for you and what is interesting to your audience. Additions covers marginalia. Additional is elements of like bibliography, telling where facsimiles, microfilms, other representations of the material are. It's kind of unfortunate they're similarly named. Came up at the MS SIG uh, meeting, MS Desk SIG meeting, and I was responding about the wrong one, and somebody said, no, no. We're talking about the other element. Oh, sorry, yes. I'm on the same page now. Um, this can actually be a little bit problematic 
you have five marginal annotations, great. Mark everyone, give a precise location, draw a zone about them. Something like MS-32, there's manicules, there's intercolumnar uh, marginalia, there's marginalia that's in the actual margins, there's all these marginal annotations that are cut off and are texts that are entirely problematic on their own. There's highlighting in the edges. Um, suddenly, there's big decisions about what are we talking about when we talk about cataloging the marginalia here. And this again comes to, is this a prose description saying, hey, there's marginalia throughout. Or is this saying the manicules point to certain items? Uh, is there one type of marginalia we're privileging over the other? Or are we doing some project that is really about this person's annotation of their text? So every marginalia is important. And we're going to list every single piece down there to the point where it kind of looks like an edition of the text crammed into this part of physical description. That is completely legitimate and quite useful, but also a huge time commitment that you have to think about before you undertake it. Seal desk, I mean, we're working on a chartal uh, project, so we deal with a lot of seals. We actually made our own authenticating thing that covers things that are authenticating like seals that is based upon seal desk, but includes other forms of authentication. Uh, but it's the same idea. There's an idea called semantic sugar, which is say that uh, seal desk and what we call auth desk are basically the same element, but for semantic reasons, we would like them to have different names, even if they are defined together. Um, but practically, we're not actually doing anything different. Accompanying material, um, like is there a bookmark, a little clipping from a newspaper, a dead moth that for some reason you really want to preserve, uh, any other material that is not notably of the manuscript, but is in the manuscript and staying in the manuscript that you would like to say something about, uh, this is where this would normally be presented. Before I move on to the next part, this is a whirlwind tour, and again, I realize that a lot of these, it depends, what are your project need things are very frustrating. So while we're talking about manuscript description, please let me know what you are interested in, what are concerns you're having for your project, or is there anything that we could make clear or more useful in our description? Uh, I would actually also just like to show a couple of our web presentations because again, what we're doing with the TEI is we are marking up content, right? As opposed to HTML or LaTeX where we're marking up presentational elements. But practically, we're always intending it, well, not always, but usually intending it to have some kind of presentational version too. What we are delinking are the decisions about content and the decisions about presentation. Um, so I will swap my screen over to, this is the project which I said, no way finished. We've been looking at one manuscript specifically because that is the only currently completely well, not completely, it's the only complete record, but it still could be improved. We're always able to add more information later. There's in the file desk places where you can put information about every time you've updated it um, and stuff like that. So here is what this project actually looks like on our development server. And so a lot of this is just HTML that has absolutely nothing to do with the TEI as a document and is not contained in any way that is portable with the TEI. It's about the project, it's not about it. There is information in the TEI that describes the project, but not this page per se. We go here and this list could be something that would actually be significantly easier and faster to hand code. However, since 
we're talking about a project where we would like to be able to upload things, change things as the actual subject experts. I'm not a Syriac specialist. Like I said, I'm a Latin and Ethiopian manuscript specialist. And I had trouble when I started this project copying the right to left Syriac text and putting it in the right place into the TEI because it was just so odd to me to copy right to left, top to bottom, and you know, so I am not going to make any major decisions about what is the right name for a text or anything like that. I'm leaving that to the specialists. I'm leaving that to the authority files that are maintained by the large project in the field that maintains the authority files. So whenever our project partners make a change to a title in the text, it pulls up on ingest the titles and refreshes this list, right? And so this is one of the big advantages of using TEI as an exchange format for catalogs is that people change all the catalog formats. You're not manually editing your presentational information. It's just transformed in uh, your data. So we're going to choose here SOP 92, Anonymous Cause of Causes. Here is I can see an error that I need to fix. This TEI is supposed to be formatted over here. But again, this is just presentational things. Tells you what I have told it in the XSLT, the transformation language, about how to take the TEI and convert it into HTML. Doesn't tell you everything about the TEI file, but it is at root the main way that we expect that experts in Syriac studies are going to be experiencing this manuscript. So we're trying to put it together in a way that is useful for them. So we see um, the presentational version of all this material that uh, we've marked up in the TEI, sorted, not necessarily, oh, I'm sorry, um, sorted not necessarily in the order that uh, it appears in the TEI file, but in the order that makes sense for the presentation thing. And when we see things like decoration here, this looks like plain text here, but where it says like folio 167 and verso, we're actually pulling a locus that describes what is being, what is there at that locus, and then we're associating them in comparable ways up and down the page. Or to show it, this is my paleographical example for the main hand. Uh, this is just a demonstration, so we haven't done the other two hands right now. But just to show uh, Syriac specialists what the characteristics of this hand are and what we mean when we describe it in specific ways in text. It is, uh, allows notes. Uh, here is the prose. And uh, here are selected images in a viewer. Uh, the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch Library doesn't want to share all of the images, so we have the selected images that they are willing to share. And then here is the content. And again, as we discussed, content is whatever is important to the cataloger about this book. It's going to be very different when you're cataloging a biblical text versus this specific text. What is important here? Uh, you can see we've drawn in CSS to show the nesting in the TEI and implemented some HTML and JavaScript and stuff like that so that you can collapse and look through the various different levels of the text. We've implemented little bits of CSS so that anything which is marked as XML language Syriac appears in red and is written right to left. Um, that is merely a presentational decision that we've made. Well, not the right to left part. Like we still had to tell the, you know, viewer that it's right to left, but the fact that this all in red is something that just we wanted to do. And in fact, there are a couple examples where the Syriac is not in red because it appears in a different context. But this is all a nice way of looking at it. But at the end of the day, our site disappears. This all gets amalgamated into another project. All of the critical data here is in the TEI file and everything that's in the XSLT should just be 
how to make this look nice. The other thing that our um, website does, well, you can see here, the additions, these are the little uh, marginal notes and where they are and specifically uh, translations, the ones that the person doing the markup thought was interesting. We have a list of bibliography in the header. Anything that appears as a bibliographic item throughout the entire corpus will automatically be pulled out of our Zotero bibliography, put in a formatted TEI file and show up in our project bibliography. And that's just the workflow that we've chosen to do that so that they just give a reference to the bibliography. Uh, but because this theoretically could circulate separately as just this one TEI file, we've also put in plain text of the bibliography items, even though for the website we're always pulling from our controlled bibliography list so that we have the most control over it. Right? So you've got to think about what do our items look like as a corpus versus what do they look like individually and how are you going to make decisions on where this information lives. Ideally, every document is completely self-documenting every possible way, but that's not always possible. And down here we have the how to cite. And again, instead of handwriting this for the entire project, I've had it automated for every document so that we see the people who are credited in the responsibility statement. We see the specific details of this document. And the way we use all this material that we've marked up in the code is not only to show all these page numbers, put them in the right order, which is just based upon sorting on the locuses, but if we look up here in uh, Project Bibliography, um, any book that appears in the certain number of manuscripts that are currently finished will just automatically be pulled in, uh, formatted through somebody else's uh, work to take all of these TEI formats and put them into HTML that I had to hand edit in order to get it to do what I wanted for our materials but was mostly done by someone else. Um, and so anytime we find a source, we add it to a TEI <laughs> document, it comes here. So it lives in the TEI document, it lives in the Zotero file, and it shows up in our presentational version with a link. Five minutes, okay, excellent. And the last thing I wanna show for this particular project is uh, a very simple thing that you can do as an example of why you might be controlling the data in specific ways other than like who worked on it, their ORCID is, well, like I said, these all have alt identifiers. They all used to be under a different catalog number than they are now. And there's a lot of publications that reference the old catalog numbers. And there's not necessarily a clear and easy way to find these. So one of the actually really interesting things to people in the field is, well, which one of these TEI files am I looking at if I want this Damascus number? So this one is backwards for that. But this one, which is the same code but backwards, is sorted by the Damascus number instead of the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch number. They're the same library, they're different numbering systems. You can do this for any piece of information that you have consistently controlled across your data set. And again, that 100% depends upon what you are interested in doing. What was of immediate apparent value to this project was making an easy lookup for them to find the file that they're used to working with from their references, and there's no other good source for it. What other things do we have? We have, by author, every MS item potentially can have an author and a title. Anytime an MS, anytime author or title appear in the entire corpus, they're automatically harvested, they're associated with the data, and then they are formatted in this list. All of these are, of course, linkable directly back to, in this case, SOP 116 is a dummy entry that only has the information needed for this index for testing purposes. And genre, we have a controlled vocabulary inherited uh, from the Syriaca.org project. 
uh, which they are using to represent genre. And in order to be compatible with them, we have represented that genre. Even though our CRX specialists would prefer a different system, they have not finished that system, but that system will also be in the project because we can accept multiple controlled vocabularies, multiple keywording systems. We can sort by them independently because they will all have their own XML ID, name, material that can be sorted independently on it. So the only one that is currently ready is the one that was already existing that was inherited from Syriaca.org. So you can see them based upon the Syriaca.org genres. And then eventually when they finish sorting them by their genre system, that will appear in parallel and you can see how these different projects think about these genres differently based upon different interests and different frameworks. Which is to say that I've been talking a lot about how you make decisions for your project, but sometimes you don't really need to make decisions. You're not forced to use one system of genre. You can use as many systems of genre as you can maintain on your end. If that is trivial, then do as many as you want. If that is complex, then maybe you're going to be limited to one because of the purposes that you, uh, the, because of the um, materials that you're dealing with in the situation. So again, this is very uh, not done, but this was kindly funded by the uh, FAF, the Austrian Science Fund, and is a project between uh, Eric, the Rare Books Librarian, and the Syrian Orthodox Patriot Library. Uh, the colleague at the Syrian Orthodox Patriarchate Library actually got promoted to bishop during the course of the project. Uh, so we have uh, nicely put down, Archbishop, sorry, um, his title down here is one of the co-principals. Um, but again, this is intended to be something of an example of a messy project that is under construction to show you some of the decisions that we're making that don't appear perfect, that don't appear hopefully unattainable, that are things that are constantly coming up with negotiation in meetings between project partners. They say something impossible. I say, I can't do that, but what do you actually need? They describe what they want and we figure out something that will be within our ability to do or maybe we just can't do it. Some things are trivial that they think are hard. Some things are hard which they think are trivial because computers are just very different than the way that we're used to working in print.